Thank you, Jonathan. So, like you said, this is about the security of the PKCS 1.5. This is joint work with T. Boyaga and Alex Mai. So, if that goes forward. Ah, right. So, basically, the PKCS number one or the public key cryptography standard number one. It's not the best one. It's just the first one they listed. It's a suite of public algorithms that are proposed for standard usage. And it used to be private, but then it was published as public requests for comments or RFCs. Amazing. So the first version is from 98. And then they jump from 1.5 to 2.0. Don't ask me. I don't get the versioning number either. And then the most recent version is 2.2 from November 16. And what we're really interested in is a RSA-based signature scheme with appendix. I'm not sure why they call it that, but essentially, as far as I understand, that's just hash and sign signatures. So what exactly are these signatures that we're looking at? Um, the point of this is that there, are no secure, there was no known security proof for these signatures. Now, it's been 20 years. There's also been no known attacks. And is this such a bad thing? Well, they came with an encryption scheme as well, and they would say that is a very bad thing because the encryption scheme has been broken from here to high heaven. And sort of to combat this, PSS was in introduced as an alternative in 2.1. PSS is provably secure and very nice. And actually, as of version 2.2, it's the recommended as opposed to just an alternative. And basically, PSS is poised to replace the PKCS number one signatures. So... Why are we even looking at this? Uh, are we sort of like locking up the barn after the horse has run out? Well, yes and no. I mean, PKCS requires one hash function, whereas PSS requires two. And the PKCS signatures do not require randomness, whereas PSS does, which is always a good thing if you can get away from generating randomness. And they are much, much, much simpler. Like, I can't impress onto you how simpler they are, so I'll just show you. Your PKS signatures are pretty simple. You prepend some padding to your hash, and then you take an ETH root modulo n. PSS is that. And I'm only about 85% sure I've got the brackets right in that. So if it's wrong, don't complain to me. Uh, also, there's a lot of legacy support for the PKCS signatures, right? So I'm talking about X509 signatures, S mine, PGP, IPsec, all TLS versions, 1.3. It's just there as because things will break if we don't include it. You've got JSON signatures, XML signatures, the list goes on. So why is there no security proof? This is a 20-year-old scheme. Somebody surely must have come up with something. Well, the signatures have almost no algebraic structure. As you remember, it's just concatenation of some padding and some hash, and you take an ETH root of that. Uh, so the standard algebraic tricks are out the window. We can't do anything there. And additionally, a fraction of Z and star are valid signatures. I say a fraction, I mean a very minuscule fraction of Z and star are signatures. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. But basically, put these all together and the known proof techniques don't really work. And it all comes down to the structure that I was talking about. So... Essentially, what you do, you take a signature of what's known as a message representative, and that's just a padded hash of your message. And more concretely, the whole padded hash looks like this. So you've got a 0, 0 exit at the start, you've got a 0, 1, then you've got a bunch of Fs to fill out the padding, you've got another 0, you've got an identifier string for your hash function, and then you've got the hash of your message. Now, you're looking at this and you're probably wondering what the scale is. So if we take a 1024-bit modulus and SHA-256, that's what we're looking at. So 768 of these bits are fixed padding. And depending on the size of your modulus and the choice of your hash function, 75 to almost 90% of the bits are fixed. And this really small part is your hash function. I mean, in some cases, you're getting less than 1% of all your Z and stars uh, are valid signatures. Okay, so I said there's uh, security proofs, which we have, and I'm just gonna go over the main proof idea and then we'll see how it drops in to known techniques. So we've got 
proofs for RSA hash and sign signatures, starting from the very first ACM CCS in 1993. And there's a long list going all the way to our recent submission, uh, recent publication this year in Journal of Crypto. But essentially, there are two points that all these proofs sort of play around. First of all, we have to simulate our signatures. And secondly, we have to extract a solution from a forgery. And these are the two points that I'll show you how we got around. So we start with simulating signatures. And in the previous proofs, pretty much all your bits are freely chosen, like full domain hash. The hash covers the entire element. So uh, with PSS, there's a little bit of, you know, side probabilities, but you can deal with that. It's not too bad. We need something where the majority of your bits are already fixed. So with the normal techniques, you, you can't really do this. And what we did is we take everything mod n and we lift it in a manner of speaking to a larger modulus n prime. And we just don't do any arbitrary lifting. We have some properties of these lifted elements. So number one, any lifted element is a valid PKCS1 message representative. So it has that uh, padding hash set up. Uh, the congruence mod n is maintained. So if you take an element x mod n and you lift it to x prime mod n prime, then x prime mod n is still x. The l least significant bits are random. The l is the output size of our hash function. This is for our proofs in the random oracle. And of course, you have to be able to compute these in polynomial time. Wouldn't really be much fun otherwise. Uh, property two is basically how we get to extract, because once we get a forgery mod n prime, we just reduce in mod n and we're, we're golden. Okay, so this is how we actually sample signatures. We take them mod n prime. Now, I said it's a larger modulus, but I didn't say exactly what it is. So what we do is we just multiply our modulus n with another prime number r. And how we sort of, then we use sort of the Chinese remainder theorem and split our padding and we put all our for padding mod r essentially and we push all the hash mod n. Yeah, that image is somewhat to scale. We have to double the size of our modulus. So r is as large as n. And also our hash function is as large as n, which is, yeah, not really normal. It's a bit weird, but it's mostly standard compliance. So, you know, we're still fine-ish. Uh, so now I'm actually going to tell you about how we sample. And um, in the paper, this algorithm is called encode. And I've sort of chopped off and fuzzed off a bit here just to explain it. So, so we take our modulus, our exponent, uh, our extra prime r, we take our padding string, and we take the length of our hash function as a uh, hash output as input. And then we do the standard thing where we model, we sample random elements mod n, and then we compute it to the eth power and use that sort of as our hash value. What we then do is we additionally check that this is now a well-formed um, message representative mod n prime. And we keep on doing this until this remainder after we chop off the padding is less than two, two to the L. So it's an actual valid hash value. And, you know, we have to do that a few times. And generally speaking, a couple of times should get you a good value. Okay, then we compute our message representative. So that's just concatenating the padding to the hash value. And then we use the Chinese remainder theorem to compute our signature. So we know the e root modulo n, which is our element we sampled. And because r is a prime, which we know, we can compute e roots there. And then we smash it together with the Chinese remainder theorem, and then we're good. And then we return the hash value and the signature, and then we store, the, we store that as a random oracle response, and sigma is the signature. Fun fact, this will work for basically any padding string, because it really doesn't care what the padding is, just how big it is. Okay. And now we go to extracting a solution. So it's the same sort of idea, but what we do is we embed uh, our RSA challenge Y in there. And we do basically the standard trick where we just multiply S to the E by Y. And we do the same thing. We keep on sampling until it's a valid uh, signature, uh, message representative, sorry. And then we store this S and Z value. 
Now, once we get a forgery, so the forgery will be of the form padding concatenated with Z to the one over E. And with a little bit of algebra, we bring it down mod N, the congruence is maintained, we take off the S, and we're done. We have our solution there. And I said proofs. Yes, there are multiple proofs, so strap in. Three hours of dry maths coming along. <laughs> but we do have four proofs in our paper, and two of them are in the random oracle model, two of them are in the standard model. So essentially, we take our sampling and embedding algorithms, and we plug it into the known proof techniques. So for large-ish exponents of uh, exponents, we have the optimal proofs in the random oracle model, and this is the proofs by Jean-Sebastien Coron from 2000. It's the same idea. And then for small exponents, it's the same idea as we had in Eurocrypt 2012. And here, small and large means uh, less than or larger than uh, fourth root of n. And then in the standard model, we found a couple of extra proofs which are fun, but these are key-only attacks. So you get no signing oracle. You just have to forge given a key. Uh, for small exponents, we show a proof to lossiness. And for large exponents, we show a proof to this approximate eth root uh, problem. And the proofs fall through very quickly. And now we have the proofs, but sort of there's a couple of caveats. And there, so we have the restriction that our proof requires these three prime moduli. Well, it's allowed by the standard because the standard just says your modulus is a product of primes, doesn't say how many. Three prime moduli are thought to be indistinguishable from two prime moduli, so that's not too bad. So you can actually, with the additional assumption that they're indistinguishable, switch back to using a two prime modulus. Um, we need hash functions with a really large output size, and this is kind of bad. But um, the standard has what's known as the mass generation function, and this allows us to get very large output. This is sort of what they use for OAAP. Uh, and also, uh, SHA-3 provides what's known as an extensible output function, and this is currently being discussed for standardization, and it kind of surprised me if SHA-3 didn't come into the standard at some point, so we should be okay in that sense in a bit. And then we really we need to double our modular size, and I don't have any good news here. So basically, the trick is that we need, we need a good probability of hitting a message representative. And doubling our module size gives us the best sort of probability for that. Uh, maybe we could find some sort of better trade-off. Maybe we could find a better encode algorithm. But this is kind of the one thing where we're slightly stuck on there. I'm doing stunning for time. Because <laughs> I'm basically done. Uh, the, so we have the security proof for the PKCS number one signatures, 20 years. Record time, I guess. Uh, the proofs are restricted, but are mostly standard compliant. We can come down to a more standard setting with, a few, with an additional assumption. We cover several cases, and essentially all of the proofs are optimal. There's an increase of parameters, but maybe we can do better. Uh, that's all from me. I'm happy to take questions now. So no? Ah, good. Thanks for the talk. Very nice. Um, you. Can you go back to the previous slide? I'm, I'm a little puzzled by the statement that uh, you say the results apply to the standard case with two moduli based on the assumption that uh, products of two primes and the product of three primes are indistinguishable. Doesn't the proof need to actually use the structure of having three primes to, to push the proof through? Uh, yes, but the thing is that it, the, so the you can start with a two prime modulus and then switch to a three prime modulus and this is indistinguishable. So you just have to add on that extra epsilon to your security proof. So it's one more step. You start with a two prime and then you go three prime and then you can start simulating and everything. So essentially you're proving that if anybody can forge the first with the two prime, then they can break whatever along the way. So you prove the security of the original 
scheme that you had on this extra third prime, which the adversary shouldn't notice. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I had a, a quick question. Also, you said that the uh, for your proof technique, the, the exact structure of the padding doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So what about the location of the padding? I mean, would it matter if the message were in the, if the hash were the high order bits, low order bits, middle? Does it matter? Um, so the way we do it exactly, uh, it only works if the padding is at the beginning. Um, I believe there's a way to do it if the padding's at the end. I recently stumbled across an old paper that does something similar, but I believe we can also do a similar trick if the padding's at the end, and also if padding is a bit at the beginning and a bit at the end, but I don't know exactly. I believe it should be possible. Yeah. Hi. Um, with the shorter hash, you don't have a proof, and then later on you say your proofs are optimal. So does that mean there's no proofs possible for a short hash? Is that your opinion? Um, optimal in the sense of security loss. So the security loss you have for these proofs is the optimal. Uh, this is a result that goes back to Corona in 2002 and so on. So that's what uh, the optimality is, that we don't say anything about short hash or anything. So I guess that answers your question. And I have a, uh, one more question about this three prime moduli. So sure. isn't that assumption just against adversaries that are just given uh, the public keys, uh, the two numbers, not with any signing Oracle or anything like that? Do you think it will hold true that indistinguishability if you're given a signing oracle? That's my uh, question. Yeah, it oh. should, as far as I can tell. I mean, so this assumption's a bit wonky, but <laughs> it's it's never really been formalized, but this is sort of something that everybody believes is true, is the assumption. Uh, thanks. That was super interesting. Um, so uh, first, a clarification. My understanding is that um, what the thing that you prove security for is, is it, it's not actually what we use in practice. Is that right? First off, so like existing. Yeah. Okay. And and so my my follow up is kind of related to the last question. Um, what do you think? Does this does does doing this work give you any insights about how where how we might find attacks on on actually deployed signature algorithms? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, doesn't well it didn't give me any insights onto how to find attacks but maybe that's because i'm not looking for them um yeah so our idea is now we're trying to figure out ways to get it where we can reduce the hash size and we have a couple of ideas but we're working on getting it closer to the more standard usage on the other hand if we get sha3 standardized and everybody starts doing the half-sized hash then we're all good so okay. i'm just hoping everybody uses my idea. <laughs> Thank you.